All right, good afternoon, everyone. It's a Friday. Thank you so much for joining us on this Friday. Uh, I always appreciate when we have folks that come in uh, on a Friday to lunch and learn with us, especially about such an important topic. Uh, for those of you uh, who don't know me, I am Alexis Alvarez. I'm the Director of Statewide Training at Florida Legal Services. And uh, for those of you uh, who, who don't know, this is the third installment in an ongoing series that uh, we've been hosting. Uh, called Snapped Up. Uh, it started with an overview. Second part was a representation of SNAP, SNAP clients. And here we are today uh, with how to maximize uh, SNAP benefits for your eligible and receiving clients. So y'all know the drill. I'm gonna take things slow, wait for people to trickle on in. We have about 32 folks in so far. I know we had over 70 registered for today. Um, so I'll start with some housekeeping. As always, this is being recorded. A copy of this recording will be sent out to all registrants and folks who are, are attending live uh, within 24 hours. That video, or I'm sorry, that recording will come from Zoom, an email from Zoom. So keep your eye out for that in your inbox. And always, if you don't get it, you can reach out to me directly. I'll put my email into the chat. Second, this was approved for CLE credit, one general CLE credit. Spoiler alert, our next and final installment of this series was approved for technology credit. So you all come back. Um, <laughs> and uh, I will drop that CLE code into the chat. I'll also put the link for the registration for um, the next part into the chat as well. Uh, third, what are my third? Oh, questions and answers. So certainly ask your questions, put them in the chat or the Q&A. I am gonna be doing some screen sharing today. So, um, Questions, if they're in the chat, we'll have to address them at the end uh, when I can take a look at the chat and then propose your questions. So don't worry if they don't get brought up in live time, we will bring them up at the end. So don't be shy, please put your questions into the chat. So I think that's it for the boring housekeeping stuff. Uh, I'll move into the introductions of our speakers who not only are presenting for us here today, but have really been integral in developing this training series that we've been able to bring to you on this topic. It wouldn't have happened without them. Uh, and I'm so happy to be doing part three with them and excited for part four. So uh, in no particular order, we have Valerie Greenfield. Valerie Greenfield obtained her bachelor's degree with high honors from the University of Florida, where she majored in sociology. She received her law degree from the University of Miami School of Law, go Canes, and is a member <laughs> of the Florida Bar before joining the Florida Senior Legal Helpline at their Bay Area Legal in 2015, Valerie was a staff attorney and later department head in the Public Benefits Unit at Legal Services of Greater Miami for 11 years. Thereafter, she served 19 years as senior staff attorney at Florida Legal Services, providing training, consulting, and litigation support to statewide advocates in public benefits. We also today have Cindy Halston, Cindy uh, received her BA from the University of Tennessee and her JD from Case Western Reserve University. Cindy is an attorney with over 35 years of experience advocating to strengthen public assistance programs for low income, low income Floridians. Before joining Florida Policy Institute, Cindy worked at Florida Legal Services and Legal Services of Greater Miami, where she represented indigent clients to maximize access to programs that provide work supports such as SNAP, the Reemployment Assistance, and Temporary Assistance for Needy Families program. She focuses on safety net programs for low-income Floridians and has an extensive experience and background as an advocate and lobbyist for policies that promote financial security for all Floridians. So, you know, you can see we've got two of the experts in the field right here. Um, and I am going to turn it over to them while I play with the technology to pull up the presentation. All right. Thank you, Alexis. Oh, great. Got it up. Um, <laughs> today. All right. So far, so good with the technology. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Alexis, for the kind introduction. And thanks to everyone who is listening in today. We really appreciate it. I'm Cindy Huddleston of Florida Policy Institute. And in this session, Valerie Greenfield and I are going to talk about ways that people can get all the SNAP benefits they're entitled to 
balance with Bay Area Legal Services. Next slide, please. But first, why, why is it important to maximize your SNAP benefits? It's important because SNAP is a critical way to address food insecurity for all Floridians who are struggling. You know, it's not just for households with children, um, although they do make up roughly 40% of the caseload. Um, in Florida, 40% of households also have a member who is a senior. 316,000 SNAP participants have disabilities, including 62,000 children. Over 80% of households have at least one member who worked in the past year, so SNAP is a fabulous work support. Over 107,000 veterans participate in SNAP in Florida. And many of these folks are Floridians who often find themselves ineligible for other safety net programs like TANF or Medicaid because they don't have children or they don't have a disability or they aren't a senior, um, but they can still qualify for SNAP, which has been proven over and over to prevent hunger, to improve health and to cut healthcare costs. Next slide. Many SNAP participants are extremely poor and live on fixed incomes and you know, don't have the financial means to afford um, food, um, medical and housing costs. SNAP provides them with a very modest benefit of about $162 a month per household member on average in Florida. Um, and this $162 is even with USDA's reevaluation of the Thrifty Food Plan, which it did in 2021 for the first time since 2006. In that reevaluation, USDA increased SNAP maximum allotments by about $8.38 cents per week per person. And although this is modest, um, don't get me wrong, the adjustment is really a long overdue first step towards ensuring that households can meet their nutritional needs for the entire month. Um, but right now, um, is it enough? Is, is the SNAP benefit enough to put, you know, protein and produce on the table all month long? And the answer sadly is no. Um, so maximizing your SNAP benefits is extremely important. It enables participants to shift the resources that they otherwise probably would have spent on food towards other immediate needs. So they don't have to make really hard decisions necessarily about what bills they're gonna pay or what needs they're gonna meet that month. Um, in fact, right now, you know, it's more important than ever. Um, if families who aren't having to rely on SNAP to put food on the table or having problems containing their grocery costs, you know, particularly right now with the very high cost of food. You know, if those families are struggling, you can only imagine how hard it is to put food on the table the whole month if you're a SNAP participant on a fixed food income. So next, I wanna to move to the next slide and hand this over to Val. So because as Cindy said, SNAP benefits can be so helpful and can help families so much, it's important that they get as much as they possibly can. And we have come up with two main strategies to maximize the SNAP benefits for each household. One uh, strategy is to decrease income. And the second strategy is to expand the number of assistance groups living under one roof. Next slide. There are two main ways. We'll talk about decreasing income first. And there's two subsets of that. To decrease income in effect, you deduct medical expenses and that changes and reduces the amount of income the household has that will be considered in doing the food stamp budget and has the effect of increasing the food stamps. The second way to do the decrease of income is to reclassify the character of some income that may be coming into the house. We're gonna talk about deducting medical expenses first, and Cindy's gonna take back the uh, helm to do that. Next slide. So as Val said, um, one way to maximize SNAP is to make sure that folks know about and take advantage of um, what's called the SNAP excess medical deduction. Although the medical expense deduction plays an important role and can play an important role in ensuring that households with high medical costs 
receive adequate benefits, it's very much underutilized. Um, for example, very few households with seniors under 20% under, under claim it at all, especially for expenses like transportation, eyeglasses, and over-the-counter medications. Next slide. So what is the excess medical deduction? In, in a nutshell, certain people, not everyone, but certain people are allowed to have unreimbursed out-of-pocket medical expenses in excess of $35 each month deducted from their income when determining SNAP eligibility. This deduction helps lower the household's net income and often, very often, boost the SNAP benefit that the household receives for the month. Um, but FYI, um, although folks can deduct almost all um, out-of-pocket medical-related costs, folks can't deduct things like costs for a special diet, Insure, for example. So here's a tip um, when you're looking at excess medical deductions and what you can count. Products that have a nutrition label on them, and for example, Insure has a, nutritional, a nutrition label on it, those products can normally be bought with staff. Um, but at the same time, because you can buy them with SNAP, you can't count them as a medical expense for excess medical expense deduction um, purposes. But although so many costs can be deducted, participants often are confused about the excess medical expense deduction or just don't even know it's available. Next slide, please. So who can get an excess medical deduction? Persons who are aged 60 and over, and that includes people who turn 60 in the month they apply for SNAP, and persons with disabilities, and that means someone who's actually getting some kind of disability benefit, those folks can deduct out-of-pocket medical expenses in excess of $35 each month. So the first $35 that they spend out-of-pocket, that's not going to, to, to be considered, but anything over $35 will be considered and most medical expenses count. Next slide, please. The medical expense deduction works just like other SNAP deductions if you're familiar with how that happens in the SNAP program. It takes the deduction from the entire SNAP household's gross income, even though it's only counting the medical costs of the individual senior or the individual household with a disability, um, and not medical costs of other household members, unless of course they too are seniors or have a disability. So everyone in the household gets the benefit um, of, of an excess medical deduction, even if it's not their particular um, 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 deduction for, the, for their circumstance. There is no cap on the amount of medical expenses above the $35 a month threshold that a household can deduct. However, in most cases, um, your health provider must have ordered in some way the item or service. It doesn't necessarily have to be in writing, although that's helpful and you may have to obtain verification later, but there must be some directive or ask of you that you, you, you um, obtain um, the um, item that you're trying to claim as a deduction in the SNAP program. Next slide, please. And I just want to give you some authority um, for it. So you'll have this later, um, with the most important being the federal regulations and DCF's policy manual. Note also, you'll see the very last um, policy transmittal listed on this from USDA has to do with medical marijuana. Just so you'll know, out of pocket medically prescribed cannabis costs cannot be deducted. So those are off the table. Next slide, please. Deductible medical expenses, however, do include things like costs for just general health care, like going to the doctor or the dentist, the acupuncture, um, hospital expenses, health insurance premiums like Medicare copays, prescription meds, transportation costs to obtain medical treatment, including um, to get back and forth to the drugstore just to get your prescription or your other health items. Homemaker, attendant aid, childcare, or housekeeping services that you need because of your age or because of a disability. Next slide, please. Health supplies, and those would be things like eyeglasses or contacts, dentures, 
incontinence supplies, and that was only recently added, and that I think would be a benefit to a lot of seniors in the state. Um, hearing aids, batteries for your hearing aids, denture cleaning supplies, prescribed over-the-counter medicine, uh, and that would be things like vitamins and acids, pain relievers, ointments, and non-food supplements like, you know, glucosamine. Medical supplies, again, like eyeglasses, oxygen, walkers, canes, wheelchairs, pain relief equipment. Um, service animal expenses, like veterinary care, um, food, everyday food that you're provided for your, for your service animal. You know, and other costs for a specially trained service animal, and the animal does have to be specially trained to be able to claim this expense. And by the way, one of the biggest increases I have ever seen for someone who had not claimed excess medical deductions um, before was someone who was vision impaired and claimed excess medical expenses for a service animal, her benefits increased by over $100 a month um, once she made that claim. And finally, um, medical related and health expenses and supplies like a humidifier or a medical alert device are also included. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, as I said before, um, medical expense deductions in the SNAP program are way underutilized, particularly according to FNS in a, a study that they did, transportation costs. And that's why it is just so important uh, for you to be on the lookout to make sure that clients are claiming the expenses that they're entitled to claim. We know that very few people claim their costs for traveling to the doctor or going to the drugstore. But these costs, you know, they really can add up um, and they can be deducted based on the actual cost. You know, for example, how much it costs for you to take a bus um, to your doctor's office or by using the state employee allowance, which right now is about, um, I think it's at 44.5 um, cents per mile. It's been at that particular level for many years, but it's set by statute, so be aware of that. Next slide, please. DCF understands that things can change and your medical condition can change and your medical needs. So you can always report additional medical expenses to DCF, even if you've already reported some. DCF may have you verify the change, but they are supposed to act on it. Next slide. Um, it doesn't matter if you haven't paid the bill yet. Um, medical expenses that you have incurred, but not yet paid can still be deducted. Note though that the interest that you pay on a credit card for medical expenses cannot be deducted. Um, but if you have to take out a loan to pay a medical bill, you can deduct monthly payments you're making, just not the interest. Not to get in the weeds too much, but something that does come up um, on occasion is that past due medical bills probably can't be deducted unless they're being paid or some kind of payment agreement plan has been developed. Um, nor um, can an expense be deducted if it is going to be reimbursed at some point in the future. Also, um, you can deduct expenses all at once or average them out over the certification period, whichever um, works to your client's benefit and makes most sense with your client's situation. Next slide, please. Federal SNAP rules require that the amount of any medical expense to be deducted has to be verified, um, just so you'll know that. So you will have to undergo verification usually. Also, in many cases, DCF is going to ask that your client provide a qualified uh, um, proof that a qualified health professional ordered the item. Next slide, please. So with SNAP, um, there are so many different ways to verify things depending on what you're trying to verify. If you're familiar with the SNAP program, you're well aware of this. The usual suspects and ways that you can verify things for SNAP purposes are um, through receipts, um, through invoices, copies of your prescriptions, um, just getting a statement from your doctor or practitioner, a collateral contact. And a collateral contact is, is defined as a verbal or written confirmation 
of a household circumstances by a third party who has firsthand knowledge about the client's circumstances. So in other words, if you don't have proof any other way, you can have someone who knows about your particular circumstance, um, like a nurse in your doctor's office, provide um, verification through um, a phone call to DCF, for example. And um, as is true with all verification requests from DCF, and this is very important, if someone has tried to verify something, if you've tried to verify your deduction, but you can't, you can't get um, what you need to be able to verify it, um, you should tell DCF and ask for their help in obtaining verification. DCF is supposed to assist in obtaining verification if it's difficult or impossible for someone to do it. Next slide, please. Hopefully to make it a little easier, um, here's a link to a toolkit um, that you can use to fill out and submit to DCF to claim excess medical expenses. But you don't have to use this toolkit. You don't have to use any particular form if it doesn't work for you. Um, although it may be a good reminder um, to you of some of the expenses you can deduct. And the good news, it is something that DCF has officially approved or unofficially approved. Um, so they have seen these forms um, and they um, um, agreed as to um, the expenses um, that were put in the form. And now I wanna hand the reins over to Val Greenfield to go over an example of how using the SNAP excess medical deduction really can in real life make a difference. Next slide. So we're gonna talk about Ms. Bluma Fleur. She's a 60 year old woman who pays $800 rent on an apartment. Her only income is social security disability insurance of 1,650 a month. She has savings of a thousand. She doesn't pay property taxes or carry insurance because she's not the owner, she's a renter, but she does pay for utilities. She has air conditioning in her apartment and her utility bill is separate. She is finding it more difficult to make ends meet. And for the first time ever, she's thinking about applying for SNAP. You do a preliminary SNAP calculation for her and you think that she's gonna get at least the minimal allotment of $20. She's a little surprised it's that small, but you tell her, you know, it's like getting a $20 coupon every month. If someone gave you that, you would probably use it at the grocery store. Next slide. But then you start digging a little deeper and you explain to her if she has additional out-of-pocket medical costs, that may help decrease her um, income and thus increase her monthly SNAP benefit. So you start to talk to her about what those expenses are. You find out she pays a Medicare Part B premium. She also pays a Part D for drugs premium. She has medical costs uh, for prescription drugs every month, three medications that cost $10 a month. She goes to the doctor at least once a month and pays a copayment of $20. You add all those up. You're not sure if they can all be deducted, but you're keeping tabs on them. Then you find out she intends to replace her distance eyeglasses next month. What she does is she alternates replacing her glasses every other year. So the distance glasses one year and the reading glasses the next year. And she spends a thousand, oh, excuse me, a hundred dollars on a pair of glasses and $50 for each exam. And she usually um, budgets that out for the, for the year. And you come up with, uh, help her come up with a monthly expense on that annualized expense. She also tells you she sees the dentist twice yearly, pays an average of $85 each time. She charges that on a credit card and pays that off monthly. You find out that a doctor told her to take omega-3 for joint inflammation. She buys a big bottle every quarter and that costs her $30. And then surprisingly, she has two doctors, specialists she sees who are 50 miles away. And she sees each of those specialists two times a year. You figure out how many miles she does annually for those two doctors alone, it's 400 miles. And if, when you average that out a month, that's 33.33 miles. And when you apply the state mileage rate that Cindy told us about, she's spending $14.83 a month just on those two doctors on the transportation, not even the copay. So you um, think about all those and you then go to the next slide because you wanna ask questions about those. 
Now, as Cindy mentioned, before we get to these questions, if she was all, if Ms. Fleur was already on food stamps, she could report these costs in the middle of her certification period, provide the verification if DCF asks for same, and they would add that. But we're just going to talk about whether you can even deduct these. So I want people to use the chat box now. We're going to go over this statement by statement. You're going to put a T for true and F for false or a question mark in the chat box if you don't know the answer or you think it's a questionable statement. First statement, Ms. Fleur can only claim a medical deduction because she gets a government disability benefit. Remember, she gets a, disability, a social security disability. Is that true, false, or questionable? Okay, so what are we seeing in the chat box? We got a, I see a false, anything else? Any other? Okay, seeing some questionable, saw some more false, saw another false, yep. Okay, so thank you uh, for those of you who participated. That statement is false because she does get a medical deduction for having a government disability benefit, but she, that's not the only way she can get one. She can get one also because she's 60, whether or not she was on disability benefits. So let's move to the next one. Transportation costs to health providers, even if far, do not count as a medical expense. Remember, she's got those two doctors who are really far away. Is that true, false, or questionable? Transportation costs don't count, even if they're far away. I see a false, I see another false, false. Good, you're on your toes. Very good, folks, you're on your toes. I see a questionable, I see a false. Okay, so the answer is that is false. This is one of the most underused um, medical expense deductions that people fail to take into account transportation costs to health providers. And for those two doctors that she has that are really far away, I think we saw that that was $14 and something. That was, that's, a, that's a biggie for a person in her situation. Transportation costs do count as a medical expense. As Cindy mentioned, you can either take the actual cost like the bus fare, or you can figure out your mileage and use the state rate. Next statement. Supplements can never be included as medical costs. Is that true, false, or is it questionable? True, false, or questionable? Thank you. I see some expense, no, some um, some remarks coming in. I see some Fs. I see a bunch of Fs. Anyone else? Thank you for those of you who are participating and playing the game. There will be prizes. No, there won't. I lied about that. There's no prices. Ha uh ha. -huh. Okay, very good, folks. So I didn't see any question marks, and I wanted to see one question mark because supplements, actually, the, the correct statement is false. Supplements can sometimes be included as a medical cost. So the statement as it is written is false. Um, a question mark would have been a good one to put because it's questionable that supplements can be included, they can only be included as a medical expense that gets deducted if they've been authorized or prescribed by a medical provider. In this case, um, she had a doctor who told her to take the omega-3. So she can, if necessary, verify that. That doctor can write a statement and that will be deducted. Finally, the statement for a normally anticipated medical expense like eyeglasses, she can only count it, Ms. Fleur can only count it the month she gets billed. Remember, she's going next month to get, change her distance glasses. She's gonna pay 50 for the exam and 100 for the glasses. Is it true or false or questionable that she can only take it next month? I see a false. Thank you for, part for participating. Anyone else? For a normally anticipated medical expense, she can only count it in the month she gets billed. Well, we don't have as many folks participating on that one. So let me just tell you, it is false. She can, at her option, either count it in the month she gets billed, report it to DCF that month, 
and increase potentially her food stamps a little bit more that month, or she can average it out. So she's going to average it out because Miss Flora is on a fixed income and she only has to recertify every 12 months. That's been the, the, the pattern for her. It's gonna be hard for her to remember to take the glasses. So she'd be better off if she averaged it out and then she knows she's gotten credit for it with DCF. Remember, she also charged her dental expenses. She only goes twice a year, but she charged it and she pays it off monthly. Now, as Cindy said, she can take the cost of the payment as a medical expense. She can't take the interest on that credit card bill, but she can count it monthly if she wants. Okay, let's move forward. Thank you, next slide. This is a link to a calculator that Florida Policy Institute developed and Alexis is going to go to it live and we're gonna show you how it works. Um, this, this can be used by clients or it can be used by advocates and you can do kind of a quick little um, test to see if it's gonna make much of a difference and how much of a difference it will make. So let's do that for Ms. Fleur. Well, first thing we have to fill in is our household size. So Alexis is gonna use the drop down menu on that one. And she's gonna select just me because it's just Miss Fleur. Next question, does your house include someone who is 60 or older or someone who's disabled? The answer here is yes. So Alexis is gonna click the yes. Uh, next, is everyone on the application a US citizen? We didn't talk about that, but we're gonna say yes. She is a US citizen. Monthly household income from jobs. Well, she doesn't have a job, so it's a zero in there. Alexis is gonna put a zero. Now, monthly income from other sources. She's gonna put 1,650 in that box because that's what Ms. Fleur gets in disability benefits. For her resources, Alexis is gonna write 1,000 in there because she had 1,000 in savings. Does monthly dependent care cost? She has nothing, so Alexis is gonna put a zero in there. Monthly out-of-pocket medical costs. Well, for all of you, I went ahead and averaged it out and came up with the monthly, and it's three hundred and eleven and forty-nine cents. So Alexis is going to put that figure there. Now, Miss Blur, next one. She doesn't have any court-ordered child support. That's a zero. Her monthly rent is eight hundred. She has no homeowners insurance and taxes. Remember, she's just a renter. Okay, does she lack a permanent residence? No, she doesn't. She doesn't lack a permanent residence. What following utility bills does she pay? Well, she pays cooling. So we check the box for cooling and we check electricity. She pays for both of those. Um, she also pays for a phone. So go ahead and check the phone. Uh, women, infants, and children, that does not apply to her. So she doesn't click any of those. And she goes ahead and she submits. She click, you click submit. Now look what happens. If you apply and get approved, your benefit may be $61 a month. Initially, you thought she was only gonna get the $20 minimum allotment, but when you encounter all those medical expenses, it boosts it to 61. So this is how you use the calculator. You can shut the screen down, Alexis. This is a, an easy way for your clients to go use that. And uh, we'll go back to the PowerPoint. And just for your, for your information, in the PowerPoint, we've embedded those same screens. So you can take a look at those later in your materials if you need to. But we're gonna move forward to the next slide, which I think is slide number 26. I think it is. Uh, we're gonna go, it's gonna take us just a minute. There we go. And we're gonna talk about the next strategy to maximize SNAP benefits. I'm gonna turn it back over to Cindy. We've already, we're, we're on decreasing income. That's the first strategy. We've talked about increasing the deductible expenses, check mark there. Now we're gonna talk about reclassifying income. So go ahead, Cindy. Next slide. So another way, as Val said, to maximize SNAP um, benefits is to reclassify income to minimize 
what counts against you for SNAP purposes. And this is done um, by looking at kind of the nature and frequency of the household's income and seeing if there's you know, some way to convert that income to a form of help that DCF won't count against you when they're looking at your income. Here are some of the uh, more common policies and principles to remember when you're looking at ways um, that income is classified and what counts and what doesn't count. Money received as rent counts as income, but the full standard utility allowance is um, permitted for each assistance group that shares in any of the utility costs of the dwelling. So if you have um, more than one assistance group living together, um, they can each count the full standard utility allowance in the SNAP program um, if they're contributing to that. Um, here's a biggie. Infrequent or irregular income in a calendar quarter of $30 or less if earned or $60 or less if unearned is not counted as income. $300 or less per quarter may be excluded from income, but only when the cash donation is provided um, by a charitable organization and based on need. In-kind benefits are not considered income for SNAP. And in-kind benefits are, are really just non-cash items, um, things like um, meals, produce, clothing. If someone um, gave you a bag of groceries, that would be an in-kind benefit that would not be counted against you in the SNAP program. Vendor payments um, are excluded as income. A vendor payment is a money payment made for a SNAP household expense by someone or some organization outside the household from funds not legally owed to the household. You know, but they are a little tricky. Um, for example, payments that are specified by court order or other legally binding agreement to go directly to a third party rather than to the household are excluded from income. And this is because those funds are not otherwise payable to the household. If someone you know, for example, pays your $800 rent payment for you out of the goodness of their heart, this is a vendor payment and does not count as income against you. Um, if that same um, person actually gave you $800 to pay rent, that would count against you. Um, if that same person was ordered to pay you $800 a month directly and instead pays your rent for you, the $800 counts as income. So you can see it, is, it, it, it can get a little tricky, um, but the rules are fairly clear and spelled out in DCF policy and in federal regulation. Next slide, please. So let's start this off by looking at an example of how income works in the SNAP program using old Dean. Um, as a hypothetical. So Aldine comes to you because her SNAP went down after she took in a roommate who coincidentally was named Rumi to help her with mortgage and utility costs. They have a handwritten lease. Rumi, um, unlike Aldine, she earns a good salary and she isn't interested in participating in the SNAP program. Three months ago, after Old Dean started having trouble making ends meet, members from Old Dean's church started giving her money directly every week for groceries. So when Old Dean had to be recertified for SNAP, um, she mentioned um, the, the, the situation that had changed in her household. She told them about her roommate. She told them about the um, money that she was getting from church members. And she was shocked when her SNAP benefits were down. So she's come to you because she wants advice about why her SNAP benefits were reduced and what she can do about it. Next slide, please. So you had some experience with this with Val, so you know. We're gonna go to the chat. We're gonna talk about different things and ask you to put in the chat box, the chat box, yes, no, or a question mark. Either you don't know or you think that, um, that it's a tricky question. It could go either way. Um, so let's start with this. So what do you think are some of the things that may possibly have caused DCF to decrease all these SNAP benefits? And by the way, when we consider the possible causes, we'll also see what, if anything, all Dean can do to reclassify that income um, so that it will not count against her. So first, 
DCF is counting Rumi's rental payment as income to Aldine. Did that possibly cause the reduction? Um, we'd like for you to please put your answer in the chat box. Yes, no, or a question mark. I'm seeing a bunch of yeses. Okay, thank you. Yes, and um, that would be correct. Thank you. Yes, the answer is yes. Since Old Dean reported the rent to DCF in her research application, as she should do, she had to do, DCF counted it. This is correct under law and policy for SNAP because rental payments do count as income. But of course, you may wonder whether Rooney can start paying her part of the rent to Old Dean's mortgage company and call it a vendor payment. Would that work? You know, unfortunately, the answer to that is no, because Rooney has a legal obligation to pay rent, rent directly to Aldean. Um, that was part of the lease agreement. So Aldean can't call that diversion of money a vendor payment, even if they try to do that. So the second thing, um, again, and put your reaction in the chat box, yes, no, or question mark. The second thing that may account for the reduction in Aldean's SNAP is that DCF may not be counting Aldean's full mortgage or utilities as her shelter costs. This is a little more tricky, but what do you think? Question mark, yeah. I see one question, question mark. mark. <laughs> no, and it's another question mark. Okay. Well, I think I think that's right. Um, again, this could very well happen. It could be that DCF does this, but if it does it, it's wrong. All Dean gets to claim her full mortgage and utilities, even though she has some income coming in to help her pay them. And finally, um, um, could DCF be counting the church members' contributions to Old Dean's income? Again, what say you? Yes, no, question mark. Could DCF be counting the church members' contributions to Old Dean as income? Yes, I see a yes. Seeing a bunch of yeses. Yeah. Okay. Because um, bright I see a whoops. <laughs> <laughs> bright group. So yes, that's correct. The answer is yes. This is likely happening, and this would be correct based on the facts. Because remember, up to three hundred dollars per quarter can be excluded from income, but only when the cash donation is received from a private nonprofit charitable organization and not from an individual. But uh, then I guess the question is, can we characterize the help from church members as infrequent or irregular unearned income? Would that work? Um, and I'm afraid the answer for that also is no, because the money she's getting from church members is regular. It comes every week. And remember, it has to be irregular. If the money is anticipated on a regular basis, it will be included regardless of the amount. So, what advice can you give Aldine for uh, maximizing her SNAP? Well, Aldine may want to think about asking church members to help her in an entirely different way. Maybe to funnel their help through the church as an institution, so it's coming not from the members, but from the church itself. Or to ask members to give her in-kind support or vendor payments to help with other living expenses, just not through direct money donations from individual church members. And let me explain, we said that in-kind benefits are non-cash items like meals or clothing and are not considered income in the SNAP program. So if church members provide all day things like a bag of you know, groceries or a pair of shoes instead of cash every week, that is not going to count as income to her and would mean that it would not affect her SNAP adversely. Um, and what about a gift card? And this is something folks don't think about. Can church members give her that? Yep, that would actually work. Um, for example, a public specific gift card or a Walmart specific gift card would be excluded as income for determining SNAP eligibility or benefit levels under FNS policy. However, there's a big exception for this. A gift card that comes from a credit card company like a Visa gift card, those are counted as income since according to FNS, they can be spent in the same way as cash. So it has to be an institution specific, um, a store specific card and not from a bank. Um, 
church members could even change their help to a vendor payment. For example, the church could pay a credit card bill for Aldine. Um, it won't count as income to Aldine because they are not legally obligated to pay Aldine that money. So there's ways that she could also get them to help do vendor payments. The bottom line is that it's really important to sit down with your client to make sure they know the lay of the plans. Um, what they don't know really can hurt them and result in less benefits. Explaining ways to lessen the impact of the help that organizations or people um, give to your client is not gaming the system. It is playing by the rules to maximize assistance in a way that federal and state law permits. So now I'm gonna turn this back over to Val to talk about how the size and composition of assistance groups affect SNAP allotments and ways to think about redefining relationships to maximize your SNAP. Thanks, Cindy. Next slide. So Cindy said we're talking about policies and not gaming the system. These are legitimate ways to change people's situations so they can maximize their food stamp benefits. We've talked about decreasing income by deducting medical expenses and reclassifying the income as in-kind or perhaps charitable contribution or perhaps a vendor payment. Now we're going to do the last strategy to maximize SNAP benefits, and that is by expanding the number of assistance groups living under one roof. Next slide. Who applies for household? <laughs> Excuse me, who applies for SNAP? A household applies for SNAP, and that's also known as an assistance group. But it's not the house that applies. It's not the address that applies. It's the people inside the dwelling. And a household or assistance group is defined as a person or group who lives together and who purchase and prepare their meals together. Now, in the past, there was a lot of case law that said that just because people lived at the same address, they didn't have to be in the same assistance group as long as they purchased and prepared separately. And we've listed some of those old cases. Two of the cases were in Florida and were litigated by the two ladies talking to you today. That's why we remember them. And why is this concept of separate assistance group important? It's because economies of scale are considered in determining SNAP benefits. The food stamp program knows that if people buy their food together, they often save money. For example, if a group of people buy one large ketchup and share it, that one bottle, large bottle, will cost less than if each person in the house buys their own small ketchup. However, the program also knows that the more separate economic units there are, buying and cooking their own food, even in the same kitchen, the more of those economic units there are, the more actual dollars and SNAP benefits will come into the picture. Compare SNAP benefits for an assistance group of three. The maximum that group can get is 658. But if you separate those three people properly under the rules and they purchase and prepare separately, each one will get a maximum or each one can potentially get a maximum of 250, which adds up to 750. The difference in benefits is close to $100 coming into that household. And I'm noting for you that the SNAP allotments will increase in October. The numbers we're using are the numbers of today. Next slide. There are some special household rules. You can't separate some people, even if they buy and prepare their food separately from each other. They have to be considered one household or one assistance group for SNAP application purposes. Those special groups are husbands and wives living in the same dwelling, even if they have separate diets and buy and cook separately. Kids under 22 who live with their parents, even if everybody buys their own food and cooks their own food, that group, the children under 22 and the parents have to be together. And then children under 18 under the parental control of an adult in the dwelling. And that would be whether they are related, um, unrelated children, living under 18 who are living with an adult, the adult and the child have to be one unit. Next slide. There is a special rule for people who are elderly, 60 or older, or who are disabled, who have low income, 
at 165% or less. Even if those people, because of their disability or their age, can't buy and prepare their food separately and they have to rely on others, those people can be their own food stamp household, even if others are helping them buy and prepare their food together with the rest of the people in the house. Next slide. These are some of the assistance group and household policies. They're found in the program policy manual at chapter 2210, and they're found in the glossary. I call your attention to the one in italics. This is plain by the rules. This is the policy. If more than one food stamp standard filing unit live under the same roof, roof if they don't buy and prepare their food in common, they can each apply as their own assistance group as long as they don't violate the mandatory member rules. Next slide. We're gonna talk about Mama. She is age 62 and she has a four bedroom house with a garage apartment. Suddenly her 22 year old son, Sonny, moves back in with her into that garage apartment when his celiac disease and arthritis get worse. He eats a medically prescribed gluten-free diet he gets SSI. A month later, mama's 40-year-old daughter, Sissy, who's employed as a secretary, along with Sissy's two kids, 10-year-old Cyrus and 21-year-old Miley, they move in. Cyrus is a fifth grade student. Miley goes to college full-time and doesn't work. Sissy and Cyrus eat paleo. Miley spends a lot of time out of the house, but when she's home, she eats vegan. They all apply for SNAP together and they're approved for fewer benefits than they think five people should be getting. We're gonna talk about whether this can be changed. Next slide. Here we go with the yes, no, and now we've added an M. Or you can use the question mark. If it's yes, uh, put a Y. If it's no, put an N. If you don't know, or it's questionable, or it's a maybe, put what, whichever one of those you like, M, question mark, can parents who live with their children be separate assistance groups, that is separate SNAP households from each other? Think about Mama and Sonny as a unit. Think about Mama and Sissy as a unit. That's a mother and a son, and then a mother and a daughter. And then you think about Sissy and her two kids, Sissy, Miley, and Cyrus. Can parents who live with their children be separate assistance groups? Yes, no, maybe. I, I see some M's. Getting a lot of maybes. A lot of maybes, okay. So the answer is maybe. Mama and Sonny could be separate from each other. Sonny's 22, so he meets that criteria. So even though he's living, even though he's living with his mother, a parent, they can be separate from each other. Mom and Sissy, same thing. Sissy's 40. So even though it's a parent and child, they can be separate. But then you've got Sissy, Miley, and Cyrus. Uh, Miley's 21, Cyrus is 10. They have to be, as minors, and a person and a child under 22, they have to be with their parents who they live with in the same assistance group. Next question. Can related adults who live with each other, let's say Sonny and Sissy moved in, can they be separate assistance groups from each other? Let's say it's Sunny and Sissy. Can they apply separately from each other or must they apply together? I see a couple of yeses, yeah. Several yeses. That is okay, yes, that is correct. Siblings, they are not parent and child. They are siblings. They can apply separately from each other. Um, if Sonny was a minor, no, he would have to be in the same household with Sissy because he's sort of under her parental control. Okay, next question. Does age and relationship, and I've kind of given you some clues, have an effect on whether related people can be separate from, assist, can be separate assistance groups from each other? Yes, no, maybe. Does age and relationship have an effect? Seeing lots of yeses. Lots of yeses. So let's talk about Sonny and Miley as a way of breaking this down. If Miley, who's 21, moves in with her uncle Sonny, can she be a separate assistance group from Sonny? 
age and relationship have an effect. She's not his child, so she has a potential to be separate, but her age makes sure that she can be separate because she's over 18. Even if she's theoretically under the parental control of Sonny, she's not 18 or younger. She's 21. So the two of them, if they set up a household, they could be separate. But if little Cyrus, 10-year-old Cyrus moved in with Uncle Sonny, they would have to apply together. Sonny's not his parent, but Cyrus is a minor living under the parental control of Sonny. That is a minor that's 18 or younger. Next question. Does having separate finances, separate diet, separate social lives while living at the same address determine, affect the determination of living together for um, food stamp household purposes? I see it. Mm -hmm. The old case law that we put in the prior slide, I see a no. Um, the old case law talks a lot about that. Separate finances, separate diets, separate social lives. So if you had two siblings like uh, Sonny and Sissy living together and the food stamp office questioned whether they were buying and preparing their food together, their statement should be taken at face value. But if it ended up going to a fair hearing, you could put into evidence things like they have separate finances, they have separate diets, they have separate social lives. You could submit their grocery store receipts at a fair hearing to show that they are purchasing and preparing separately. Um, but what about the fact that Miley has a separate social life from her family that she lives with? She eats a different diet, she's barely there, she keeps her finances separate, her school loans separate. Will that, will those factors overcome any mandatory household rules? The answer is no. So even if that was all true for Miley, because she's under 22 living with a parent, she must be in that same household with her mom. Extra credit, can anyone in this group deduct medical costs? Yes, no, maybe. Can anyone deduct medical costs? No, I see a no with all caps. I see a yes, yes, yes. Well, the answer is yes. Mama is over 60. She can deduct medical costs, even if she's with everybody else. We don't know if she did that. Maybe that would help. And Sonny, he gets a disability related benefit. He gets SSI. He can deduct medical costs. So even if they all applied together, if, they, if Sonny and Mama started deducting their medical costs, maybe that would help. Uh, double extra credit. Can college students get SNAP? I get a yes, yes, yes. Cindy, what's the special rule on college students? Thank you for asking. Is there a special rule for college students? And if someone is attending an institution of higher learning um, more than half time, and that's determined by the institution, they will not be able to get SNAP unless they meet an exemption. And there are several exemptions. Um, this is something that has been quite controversial in the past few years because of um, the instance of hunger among college students. We're hoping there's gonna be some movement at the federal level. Um, but if you're in um, college for more than half time, you're gonna to have to meet an exemption to be able to get SNAP. Okay, next slide. So how would, it how would you guys out there configure these assistance groups to maximize SNAP for these people? How many households? Give me a number. What do you think you can break this down? What's the maximum you could break it down into? Can I see some numbers in the chat? One household, two households, five households. I saw five, I saw three. Anyone else? Five, four. Well, I think the answer is three. Cindy, what do you think? I agree with you, Val. Okay, so I think mama can be separate. Sonny can be separate. But sissy's got to be with those two kids. So, you you know, you could, you could mix and match them. 
But because of that mandatory household rule of a parent and children who are under, 21, under 22 living together, they have to be considered as a single food stamp household, even if they don't buy and cook their food together. Because of that, I think you've got to stick Miley and Cyrus with um, Sissy. So I think that's got to be a single one. And then the most you can do is separate, excuse me, Sonny and Mama. So that about wraps up that. Can we take any questions, if there are any? Next slide. I think the next slide just says questions on us. So Alexis, do we have any questions? Sorry, give me a quick second. I ended up when I ended up getting the screen shared down when you said that it was done, and then so <laughs> and I can confirm the last slide says questions. It's a very pretty. The slide. Last slide is just a very <laughs> colorful question mark, <laughs> and it's very very pretty. I'm sorry, I, I was doing so well with my technology. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I actually am getting the chance to look at the chat for the first time when I'm screen sharing. I can't really. So you're going to see well. a lot of yes, no. <laughs> Those aren't necessarily questions. I do see that. And I don't see any questions. Um, you know, let's, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to put the CLE information in the chat, put some information in the chat. And folks, if you have any questions, uh, we have a few minutes, you know, to answer them. So please uh, feel free to drop them in the chat. So let, while, while folks are doing that, let me tell you my um, email address and Cindy will tell you hers. Mine is V for Val, V Greenfield, which is my last name, at BALS for Bay Area Legal Services, BALS.org. And if you have trouble with food stamps or you have a food stamp question, especially for people who are 60 and older, because I work on the senior helpline, I would be glad to help. Cindy, you want to throw your. Um, your email out there for folks? Yes, yeah, it is Huddleston, H U D D L E S T O N, at Florida Policy, as if it was one word, dot org. Okay, so we've got uh, in the chat, we've got the, um, we've got our, our emails there, and we know it's approved. So no, it's not a technology, it's a general credit. No, I know. So hold on one second. So what I've put in the chat is the CLE code for this uh, particular installment of our training series, which is 6329. Again, Correct. that's 6329. And this session has been approved for one point, uh, I'm sorry, one general <laughs> CLE credit. I've also put into the chat, but the link didn't come up. So I'm going to paste that in now. The registration for our next event. Our next event is going to be on September 23rd at noon. And that uh, installment is approved for one general and one technology CLE credit. That registration I'm going to put into the chat while I let Val read the question that just came okay. in. Uh, I to see. Give an answer. It says, do expenses for pets, such as emotional support animals and the expenses associated count? toward the amount the person gets. Cindy, how, how verifiable does the emotional support animal have to be? We um, know that the expenses can be deducted, but does it have to be some kind of an approved animal, licensed, certified? Doesn't have to be licensed, doesn't have to be certified, but does have to be specially trained. So you okay. probably will have to provide some kind of proof that this animal has special training um, to be able to get the deduction. Right. So uh, it's a, if the therapy pet has had special training mm -hmm. to be an emotional support animal, because that's the phrase that was used in the question, then the expenses associated with that animal will count towards the medical expense deduction. It will be a deduction from the applicant's income. And when you reduce the income, it tends to increase the benefits of SNAP that you can get. And I also want to encourage folks, even if you don't have questions now, if something comes up in your practice, please feel free to reach out to either of us. Um, and we'll both be able to, uh, we'll be glad to help as much as we can. And what I'll do is I'll also include Val and Cindy's email in the follow-up that comes uh, within 24 hours. Um, any other materials as well, the link to uh, the online uh, calculator, 
all of that will be embedded into the email that you all will receive tomorrow. It comes within 24 hours and it comes from Zoom. Of course, if you don't see it, I'm going to drop my email into the chat now. Um, by now, I feel like you all should probably have it. Um, but please feel free to reach right out to me if you don't get it and I will make sure I forward it to you directly. So in the chat, you have the CLE code uh, for this training, which again, I'll read it one more time, is 6329, it's in the chat. You have the registration for our next installment of this series, which is going to be September 23rd. Um, and you also have uh, Val and Cindy's uh, direct email address, so you can email them all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I don't know if there's anything else that you uh, want to say, Val and Cindy, before we close off on this wonderful Friday. No, we really appreciate um, folks uh, tuning into this four part series. We really would love to see the level of participation in the SNAP program boosted overall in Florida. And we want to make sure that all of you have the the equipment you need, the toolkits you need, the knowledge you need to serve these folks and make sure that they're getting the benefits um, that they're entitled to. Absolutely. Yes. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Um, and thank you so much, Val and Cindy. Um, it's been a pleasure to learn from you uh, throughout these series. I look forward to the, the next presentation uh, to learn more from you. So, um, at, you're getting lots of thank yous in the chat. <laughs> Wait, someone says they're going to have their mother needs to <laughs> with SNAP. Don't have their have her contact me directly. Let me give you the telephone number for the senior health line. Okay. It is one eight eight eight. Hold on, I don't want to do it wrong. Um, one eight 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 nine five seven eight seven three. 1-888-895-7873. That is the senior helpline. Anyone 60 or older who's within 300% of poverty can be assisted by the senior helpline, not just in food stamps, but in all your traditional um, civil legal services type problems. Awesome. I'll also be sure to add that in that follow-up email as well. Um, Oh, Cindy put in more, a little bit more on companion animals. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much again for being here. Have a wonderful rest of your Friday. Enjoy your weekend, and we will see you at the next one. Thank you, Alexis. Thank you.